Hello friends, so today we're starting our second set in the series on Baha'i Cosmology. And I want to stress a couple points, do some review and then move on. One of the things I want to stress that I mentioned last time was the difference between shallow and deep unity. So often the unity of religion is presented as if they are unified in the fact that they relate to or refer to the domain of the sacred, and in addition to this they have moral principles or ethical principles or spiritual principles that seem to thread throughout the different dispensations, such as the virtues of compassion, of honesty, of justice and mercy, of forgiveness. And while this is true, one might say that these are simple expressions, if you will, of the different ways in which humankind has found that we can live together in a cohesive whole. And that this concept of the sacred, yes, while being, say, uh, uni <laughs> unified, if you will, is radically, radically different. And I mentioned this in the last video, that oftentimes when we look at the different world religions, we see a conception of God within the Old Testament that doesn't seem to really accord with the way God is expressed in the New Testament. Or the God of the New Testament seems to be radically different than that of the Quran, or for that matter of the Buddhist or Hindu scriptures. And when it comes to the Baha'i writings, as I said, I want to try to show that there are models and ways of looking at the sacred in its realms, in its layers of ontology, layers of existence, and see that actually we can find a deep unity, that the Baha'i faith holds within it a model of religious unity that has not really been explored. Now this is understandable. I know when I've had the, the blessing of sitting in the presence, say, of Christians or secularists or Buddhists or Muslims, etc., throughout my life as a Baha'i, uh, a discussion will ensue between different Baha'is on the perspective of the manifestation of God and how that might relate to the Christian or the concept of the divine itself, and how that might relate to Buddhism or Hinduism. And oftentimes, what we end up having is, uh, if you will, a beautiful debate amongst Baha'is ourselves. Because what we have within the Baha'i Faith is a shocking amount of scripture. The writings of the Bab, of Baha'u'llah, of Abdu Baha, Shoghi Effendi, and elucidations by the Universal House of Justice, are really, really something that would actually fill multiple shelves. So naturally there's a challenge that we have to be able to come to a place of a true and unified understanding of what the Baha'i writings themselves are saying. And this truly is understandable. Uh, every dispensation, every religion throughout the history of humankind has had to go through this process of attempting to understand what these different texts are saying, while we all might agree that they are sacred or that the messenger is divinely sent, we haven't got a, if you will, a perfect and never will have a perfect handle on what is actually being expressed within these texts. Very often this actually occurs through trying to fine-tune what it is that these dispensations say in their relationship to another religion. For example, Christianity itself had a great deal of answering <laughs> to, if you will, the Greco-Roman world, as well as with the Jewish world, and trying to, if you will, pin down what it is that is actually being said in the New Testament, and the process of dealing with very dominant or prominent views that, say, if you will, certain groups didn't actually believe were correct. And it is this process of dialogue and discussion and debate simply that I'm hoping to begin here. As I've said previously, I hope this is really seen merely as a conversation starter, as a, as a longing to try to have the opening of a conversation about a framework of what the divine is, what are the layers of reality, and what is the sacred within the Baha'i writings. So I chose this quote initially, one because of its familiarity, and secondly because it actually has a clarity. It gives a picture where we can see that Baha'u'llah in this prayer seems to be referencing a series of layers. And we looked at these as um, all created things, the realm of Nasut, the inmates of the All Highest, the Concourse and High Zuri, Malakut, the inmates of the All Highest Paradise, Jabarut, the realm of power, and beyond them the tongue of grandeur itself from the all glorious horizon. So you have all created things, Nasut, Concourse and High, Malakut, the inmates of all highest paradise, and beyond them the tongue of grandeur itself, 
that thou art God. So we end up seeming to have created things, concourse on high, the inmates of all is paradise, and the tongue of grandeur itself, that thou art God. And it's stating that the one that has been manifested is he whose name have been sent down with the pen of the Most High, and through whom the letters B and E have been joined in it together. That existence itself was joined in it together through this one that was manifested. So again, what I want to really stress here just for a moment is that this is not a list, if you will, a horizontal list, that this is actually a hierarchical list, a taxonomy, a structure of ontology that is being expressed by Baha'u'llah in his prayer. That there is the created things, the concourse and high, the inmates of the all-highest paradise, and beyond them the tongue of grandeur itself, from the all-glorious horizon, that thou art God. So we begin to have this, if you will, fivefold structure, this fivefold reality that is the model that we're trying to, if you will, launch this study from, and begin that as the fundamental basis for our exploration. So in this, one of the things I want to do is to take a look at a series of different texts that seem to outline this massive structure. And I want to also try to if you will, illustrate that many of these concepts, while seemingly theologically specialized or rarefied, are actually not bizarre concepts at all. They are concepts that we, oddly, I think, experience almost in everyday life. That there are, if you will, signs and traces and tokens within the world that we experience that give us a sense of these different stations and these different realities. So that is something I will be pausing at times to go into and to explore more fully. So at this point, I want to begin with the realm of Hahut, the realm of ultimate reality. At the beginning of this passage, it's stating if we were to ponder in our heart for all time, with all of the intelligence and understanding of the greatest of minds, this divinely ordained and subtle reality, and the sign of the revelation of the all-abiding God, we would fail to comprehend its mystery. Now, it sounds at first as if we're talking about the manifestation of God, or we might be talking about divine reality itself, but it says, Having recognized thy powerless to attain an adequate understanding of that which abideth within thee, you will readily ad admit the futility of trying to understand ultimate reality itself. And I think this is very profound and very beautiful, and it's trying to place human conceptions within their rightful place. You know, I often have said in you know, firesides and deepings and conversations that I, I consider, for example, God the all-knowing, one of the, you know, the common appellations of the divine, if you will. And literally, I don't know how many socks I have. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how many books I own. I don't know the square foot of even really a single room in my house without actually having to go back and measure it. So when I begin to consider the all-knowing itself as a title, as a station, as a reality, it is absurd, utterly, utterly absurd, to think that I could comprehend the divine itself. And here it's talking about even that subtle reality inside ourselves. And I think it's generally an experienced reality that we do not fully understand even the consciousness within which we abide. We're not really fully aware of the reality of any other consciousness, right? And let alone any other consciousness, uh, but even our own. And I think that when we begin to look at these, if you will, common titles of God, the all-powerful, right? The all-knowing, the ground of all beauty and virtue, that when I try to take a look at power, I actually have exceedingly limited efficacy over my reality. I control, control my body, and I can control what comes out of my mouth sometimes, and I can manipulate things in the world. Yet, if we're really going to begin to consider the concept of God, whether or not God even exists, but if we begin to actually consider the concept of God, I start thinking of things like the sheer force of tectonic plates. Or I consider the power of, say, Niagara Falls, just the sheer power of it, let alone the power of the planet itself, right? Or the molten core, or the power of one sun. 
when I begin to consider, say, the power of like the movement of the planetary core, or tectonic plates, let alone the Sun, my mind has already maxed out on any conception of actually how much power that is. It's like if you say something, and I know we have words for these things, it's like if you say, well this is a billion light years away, or a hundred thousand light years away, really that just suddenly just completely taps out my mind. But what that really could possibly mean? So when I consider, say, the, the sheer force and power that is actually encased within a single atom, right? Maybe if you consider the power of an atomic bomb. I, I can't co-op, I cannot properly conceptualize that, let alone the sun itself, or the amount of power it exerts over the planets within our solar system. I can't ima imagine the power within a small cross-section of the planet I live on, or even the power that is actually held within a cup, literally the physical material of a cup. But if we begin to have this movement, if we start considering the reality of the amount of sheer force and power of the laws of nature and what they govern throughout our Milky Way, this, this becomes just utterly nonsensical. But God, even if God wasn't real, the conception of God is the all-powerful, the source of all the laws of nature in the universe, the author, the one who actually created all sources of power that a human being or any eternally living being within this cosmos could experience. But this brings us to another concept, if we actually look at truth itself. I am standing in a room, and there is a truth as to how many fibers are in my jacket. There is a truth to the distance of my face from the camera. There is a truth as to how many if you will, microorganisms are in this room. And there is a truth as to what is the spatial relationships between all those microorganisms in this room. Or the spin of an electron, and its electron shield within every part of my body. As soon as I begin to really contemplate any physical object that I could possibly think of, and then simply take in the room that I'm actually standing in, the amount of, if you will, truths that one could know about this room is unfathomable. I don't even know all the objects in the room that I'm standing in. So when we begin to start to, and this is what I really hope people will do, when you really begin to contemplate what it means to be the all-knowing, it is unfathomable. If I was to meet an individual who could tell me every single object in this room, and all their spatial relationships, and all their temperatures, and all the movements, and how long they will exist, how long it will take, you know, the cardboard, which is in this room that my son uses to create things, and how long it will take it to deteriorate in each and every specific issue, the fluctuations in temperature, on and on and on and on. If I were to meet one person who just knew all the truths about this room, let alone, and I'm barring even my own thoughts and my hopes and my desires and my dreams, just the actual physical relations of this room. But if I now take that very concept, just like I did with power, and I begin to expand it out, and I begin to actually push that out, well, what if I knew everything within the city I live? where everyone is, how fast every vehicle is moving, etc. And then I just push that, if you will, push that, that threshold out and out and out and out. I have already, if you will, you know, tapped out in a sense on the idea of knowing everything in a small room in my own house, let alone within a city, a province, a country, a continent, a planet. Once I start moving that out to understanding what the all-knowing means with implications of even my own solar system, we're talking about an amount of particles that is just utterly inconceivable. And there is a very strange fact that there is a truth, actually. Whatever that means, there is a truth right now about how many, if you will, living beings there are, say, under the surface of Europa, or are not. There are truths out there for all these things, and the concept of the divine is that 
that truth is known by an entity, which we commonly refer to as God. This goes to when we look at, I've experienced virtue, for example, in beauty. When I see beauty and I experience both physical beauty and the beauty of goals and purposes within my own life, the things I strive for, the things I see others strive for, and I even mean not in the philanthropic sense, but when someone is trying to be a beautiful artist, when someone is attempting to reach out to humanity and share their hearts, if you will, the, the currents of their heart in visual art, this, there's beauty there that is unbelievably exquisite, but that can be in billions of hearts. Let alone when we begin to move through concepts like how many times a day today has someone in the face of wishing to be dishonest for their own self-benefit actually chose to be honest. And these are actually, very peculiar to some maybe, quantifiable conceptions. Now we might not be able to gather all of them, and some of them might be self-interested or partially mixed up with self-interest, but you have individuals throughout the human population right now striving to be generous or being generous. And imagine taking all of that generosity, or collecting, if you will, the love of every single mother for their child, right? Or the sacrifice that any, say, father might make for his son or his daughter. Or the compassion that all of these millions and billions of people might have for their fellow human beings, even if it was one fleeting moment within their life. And we were to collect that over the course of human history, all the virtues and attributes, which are often the, if you will, the attributes expressed of God, it himself, herself, right? We start to get a sense of what love might be. And it is surely unfathomably beyond the heart of this individual, or the heart of any individual that I know. So I wanted to stress this at this moment, that it is really important when we begin to look at religious texts, even if you don't believe in the existence of God, to begin to contemplate what it is like, what the reality of that title is, the all-knowing, the all-loving, the self-subsisting, right? These are things that are unfathomable to us. And here it's telling us that we are to try to look at even our own selves. And I would, I myself even went around myself to, to explore what it means and how little I know of what I even know. How little I know of even the nature of my own love or my own capacity for honesty, my own capacity for justice, right? There are truths even in my own mind that I don't even remember learning that suddenly come to my mind in the moment of talking. We ourselves are wellsprings. And it's saying, if you come to a recognition of the sign of one's own self and of the reality around you, you will recognize the futility of such efforts as may be attempted by thee or by any of the created things to fathom the mystery of the living God. And I do genuinely believe, and I offer it for your contemplation, that this is a self-evident truth, if one is willing to be mindful of reality. And this is going to be a common theme as we move through cosmology, that very often what religious texts, sorry, what religious texts, what religious scriptures are asking us to do is to be exceedingly mindful of the reality in which we actually live and try to come to terms with it whether it be ugly or beautiful, and to recognize those things. So we're going to move now. I leave that in your, in your heart and mind. We're going to move to another text, and this is actually from um, Abdul Baha in a work called The Promulgation of Universal Peace. Here once again, Abdul Baha is asking us to contemplate the world of existence. So we're saying, what is the reality of divinity, or what do we understand by God? And Abdul Baha is saying, well, consider the world of existence, be mindful to it, and find that the essential reality underlying any given phenomenon is unknown. So he's saying this isn't just some peculiar notion that we might actually apply to divinity itself, but rather man, quote, man discerns only manifestations or attributes of objects, while the identity or reality of them remains hidden. So I might take the simplest of objects, a coffee cup, Right? 
And as I'm looking at this coffee cup, I am seeing a visual experience of that object. I'm seeing its shape, its color, I might pick it up and I might feel its weight. And as I increasingly begin to actually study it, its features, its shapes, maybe its cracks or chips, I'm still seeing an external expression, a manifestation of some fundamental underlying reality that I do not have access to. This is actually a physical manifestation of some exceedingly odd object in its fundamental reality. So I only perceive, quote, its external appearance and manifest attributes. Those are that's what are noble to me. But the inner being, the underlying reality or intrinsic identity is beyond my conception. Given that the reality is a material phenomenon, are themselves impenetrable and unknowable, and I guarantee within our fundamental physics we're going to be exploring and exploring and exploring and exploring, and new richnesses and peculiarities are going to be presented to us, even if we're simply studying a coffee cup. Then, he says, how much more this is true concerning the reality of divinity. That wholly essential reality which transcends the plane and grasp of mind and man. That which comes within human grasp is finite, and in relation to it we are infinite because we grasp it. So, Abdu'l-Baha makes a statement here for us to consider that if the reality of divinity could be contained within the grasp of a human mind, it would after all be possessed of an intellectual existence only, a concept without extraneous existence, an image. And this, what we find within the writings of Abdu'l-Baha over and over, he stresses this fact that actually if we have a concept of something, if we have a concept of divinity, that is something that we can picture and we can create this image or likeness or this understanding, we ourselves are superior to that understanding. Because it is something, an idea, a concept that we can contain. So once again he's using this idea of look at the physical world, look at the created world in which you exist, pay attention to it that your access to even the simplest of things, right, themselves are only through attributes and manifestations. And if you're now moving to, if you will, a concept within your own mind, not even looking at a physical thing, and you're attempting to create this image or likeness within yourself, that is actually circumscribed, is actually surrounded by and contained within your own mind. So he's telling us that we know God by his attributes, signs, names, its phenomena, its attributes and traces. And I suggest this isn't actually a peculiar notion at all either. We know all phenomena by their, if you will, names, their signs and their attributes, right? The traces that we have of it, even when we're actually looking at something like an elementary particle, we're, we're working through the medium, right, of some secondary observation where we're trying to see the reality of something from its external phenomenon. And if this is so natural and perfectly understandable within the everyday realm, why would it then apply somehow differently to the divine? And we will return to this again and again. Ask, answering the question how the reality of man can ever comprehend the reality of God. He says it is self-evidently an impossibility. Hence we can observe the traces and attributes of God, resplendent in all phenomenon and shining as the sun at midday. So when we look at the truth of the reality of divinity, we see that this isn't actually a bizarre concept that we would only be able to know, if you will, manifestations of that divine reality, of that unknowable essence, if you will. Because within the, within the creative world we experience all the time, that's what we experience. We experience the attributes or qualities of a physical object. In addition, we actually experience only, if you will, the attributes and qualities and names and signs and traces of each other's consciousness, of each other's personalities. This is what's happening in this very moment. You're seeing the signs and traces and manifestations, if you will, of my thoughts and feelings surrounding some subject. You don't know the inner essence of what my thoughts are, 
or what my un un underlying and ultimate nature is. You're just seeing a physical body in front of you moving in certain ways and expressing signs and traces of an intellect and thoughts and feelings underneath. It's why we have to be really, again, and we'll stress this, really pay attention to the reality in which we live. So now we're going to move on to some other central, if you will, meta-texts. And by meta-texts I mean ones that will give us an understanding of, if you will, the overarching conception. Here we're going to move into several quotes from the Bob. And I find some of the ways that the Bob, in the selections from the writings of the Bob, expresses this is profoundly poetic and exquisitely clear. So it says, we're, if we're sailing on the sea of God's names, reflected in all created things, we would see that the divine being is sanctified from being known or described by his servants. That everything you're seeing has been called into being through the operation of his will. Now, we just looked at this in the quotes of Abdu Baha. And if we look at, if you will, remember we were I was expressing how if I say like God is all knowing, well, obviously when I say all knowing, and I try to stress this and stretch this, that is only going to push, if you will, to the outward borders or periphery conceptually of what I can think of of knowing all things. And obviously that is a unfathomably pale conception, given I can't even really understand, as I said, what it would like to know everything that's in the room and all the truths contained within it, literally have a room in which I'm standing, right? And that any description, if I say the all-loving, that's going to be an expression of as far as I can strain my concept of loving. Okay? We're going to move to paragraph four. Every experience we have of something, really of anything, is through its manifestations and signs, through its attributes, through its names and its descriptions, its qualities. And what I propose is that when we really look at this concept of what normally we try to say of, as God, the term used in the Baha'i writings being Hahut, which actually has its history within the Islamic tradition, that in the Baha'i writings, this reality is actually that which is behind the attribute. That's what is behind the traces and signs and manifestations of the divine. Then in a sense, it is even beyond what is ineffable. That any, any, if you will, appellation, every description, any quality we could possibly give to it, will only be an expression of some attribute or quality of that reality, which is not its essence. And I want to cut here for a second just to, to really hammer this home. In my own understanding, in my own studies of the Baha'i writings, ultimate reality is actually almost never talked about. It is referenced as a reality, but that discussion quickly moves within the Baha'i writings to an expression of this primal will of God that we will see in this passage, the first remembrance. Because the manifestation is the embodiment of the attributes, the traces, the signs. So look at this passage. If you're sailing in the sea of creation, right? So if you were sailing upon the sea of names, and imagine this, you have all this, the all-loving, the all-knowing, the all-compassionate, the most just. You have all these different, if you will, names on the top of a rolling ocean. The Bob here is saying, if you're sailing on this sea of names, you realize that none of these actually can describe that reality. Hahut. That thou art God. Right? And even that's going to become qualified. But see, they have all these names, and they're not actually describing. They're mere quality signs, attributes that are manifested for our sake. And then suddenly he moves in the next very next paragraph and says, However, if you're sailing upon the sea of creation, so we're in the sea of creation, 
Know thou that the first remembrance, which is the primal will of God, may be likened unto the Son. We're going to see this come up again and again and again in the Baha'i writings. Very often, I think we, and there's good reason for this, will take the expression of the Son of Reality, or the image of the Son, to be a reference to God Himself. And I'm going to propose this early on, that that actually is not what's going on. And it says here, the first remembrance, which is the primal will of God, may be likened unto the Son. And Abdu'l Baha says the same thing. But then suddenly it shifts. It says, God created him through the potency of his might. And he hath from the beginning that hath no beginning caused him to be manifested in every dispensation through the compelling power of his behest. And God will, to the end that hath no end, continue to manifest him. There is a profound divine singularity occurring here. The image of the Son within the Baha'i writings is relating to the primal will of God, the first remembrance of God, if you will, the embodiment of all his attributes and signs in, or if you will, on the sea of creation. So in the sea of creation, there is this primal will that can be likened unto the Son, and this primal will, this first remembrance, again, quote, is manifested in every dispensation, and God will continue to do so, continue to manifest Him to the end that knoweth no end. So what you suddenly have is there is this Son, and I'm going to propose now that this is what we mean by Lahut, the tongue of grandeur, through whom the letters B and E have been joined in it together. And this entity we see manifested, right? in every dispensation, uh, from the beginning that hath no beginning unto the end that knoweth no end. So there is this divine singularity which we see in the multiplicity of different representations, and not only upon earth, but all throughout all of creation. And again, I would recommend the friends, if you're interested in some of the other topics surrounding this, to look at the worlds beyond deepening and see a fuller expression of this. And we'll get back to that. Look at this now. There is this divine reality, and I'm going to say this is the manifestation. Okay? This primal will, there has not ever been more than one sun, the Bob says here. And this primal will appeareth resplendent in every prophet, and speaketh forth in every revealed book. And it's interesting, it knoweth no beginning or end. We keep having the same thing that were the settings of the sun to go on forever, right? It would always be this one sun, and it has no beginning or no end. And this entity is, if you will, the source and focal point of all the names of God. He says, you know, with beginning, no beginning, inasmuch as the first deriveth its firstness from it. The concept of firstness itself is actually a description of that entity, that Son. We're now moving to paragraph 6. And again, I want to stress this. This is, off, this is a picture that I see that is different than how I often hear it described. There is this one Son that has actually speaketh forth, as, sorry, has appeared resplendent in every prophet, speaketh forth in every revealed book, right? It was Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, the point of the Bayan, which is the Bab himself, him whom God shall make manifest, Baha'u'llah, and the one who will appear after him. So there is, it's not simply that they're sharing a story and they're unified in their conception of sharing a tale of the divine being, or they each are kings, if you will. Now we're going to see that there is a distinction somewhat between them, but that there is one Son that is manifested in this multiplicity. There is the one, and then there is the many. If you will, there is the zero, <laughs> ahut, nothingness that we can describe, the single, the one, and then all the different numbers, if you will, being built up out of that set. This is something that we will see repeat again and again and again. 
And now I want to actually go to another quick reference here from the Bob. In this passage, he's saying that really in the end, if we were to be truly, truly and deeply aware, we would realize that any description would be a wanton crime. Whatever praise I may glorify would be sheer blasphemy. What is it meaning? It's saying that no matter what any entity, and this is including the Bob himself, would describe of thine essence, right, would actually be utterly and completely short of the reality of even the seat, if you will, of those attributes. Now, again, I want to try to, if you really look again at some of the simple examples I gave, imagine, if you will, a dog, your dog or your cat. And that dog or that cat is attempting, through meows or barks, to describe the reality of their master. But you know that that dog or that cat is sitting in your living room with you. Say, even listening to this, or you know, listening to you discuss history or anything, really. They might actually be just discussing how to open a doorknob. <laughs> that dog or that cat cannot understand what you're talking about. It has no access to the domain of your purposes and goals and plans, overarching hopes or dreams. The dog doesn't know what a doorknob is. It can't really understand the mechanics of a window. It really will have no conception of what a fork is. Yet, are we expecting that this dog is able to describe the reality of even the simplest human being? Imagine a child, right, trying to express how smart someone like, say, Albert Einstein is, or Niels Bohr, Charles Darwin, someone trying to attempt to express truly how, say, the piercing insight that they actually possessed. Well, unable to do so, they would have to be that individual's peer to really get a sense of how intellectual or understanding they were. If we cannot truly express the complexity of a piece of stone, right? Literally, we have whole disciplines, physics and chemistry and geology, etc., to try to describe this. How are we to ever describe the complexity of another human being? Not even a brilliant scientist or our own self. And again, walk this up. Try to look at what this shows us about reality. Right? So if we have the ineffability, the inability to describe, even the lesser, how much more the greater. Uh, the Bob actually does say, no pure or likeness, nor similitude or equal can ever be joined with him, God. And then he turns to this passage, and look at the titles that are given to this being. The divinely inscribed book. It'll spread tablet, frequented fane, and it says the tree of divine revelation, the surging ocean, the light above every light. The loftiest point of adoration, and again, the tree beyond which there is no passing, the blessed lot tree, the most mighty sign, the most beauteous countenance, and the most comely face. So, here the manifestation of God and we're going to see that actually the concepts of the tree beyond which there are no passing, the lot tree, the most mighty sign, and the countenance of God are all titles of the manifestation of God. Even more, or if you might say even lesser, we'll find that it's actually his speaker unto whom these actual titles are applied. But that there is this place we can reach where we meet the face of God. Because beyond there is essence. That we only see, if you recall in the passages above, we only see the manifestations of the sun. And that's the analogy we use for the manifestation. So even the manifestation of God, and remember this is singular, that which appears in Noah and Abraham and the Buddha and Krishna, that that being, we only see its face, if you will, the face of the sun. 
the attributes and surface of the Sun, its radiance and heat. We don't know its essence either. How much more do we not know the divine, ultimate divine court, if you will, Tahut? Now, this is where I think this is where we sort of have to have a break in our, uh, in our discussion. Because really what ends up happening within the Baha'i writings is discussion of Hahut, that ultimate heinous, the essence of essences, if you will, is done. Because it's in the realm already of ineffability, and we only know its manifestations and traces and signs. And the Baha'i writings, those of the Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdu Baha, ultimately and unendingly acknowledge that it is that essence behind the essence, if you will, that is the source of all, and that they are mere servants of it. Much of the cosmology, the layers of ontology, because they can be discussed, suddenly fall beyond that top realm. This becomes just a blank. That really we only speak of when we're doing theology and cosmology. We only really are talking about Lahut. We're only talking about the manifestation, the comely face, the countenance, the tree beyond which there is no passing, the divine low tree. That's what we're really, really talking about. And I think this is going to ease our passage through these subjects and enable us to get more particular and more precise and look at more and more writings surrounding this. Because really, Hahut is crossed off. Now, in addition, if we look at this, well, if we're trying to look at what realms we're talking about, and one is literally just, you know, an X, right? And a, and a zero behind a zero, if you will. We also already have explored the realm of Malakut, to a certain degree, on Bridging Beliefs. This is the Worlds Beyond series. I believe there's seven sets, if you will, seven steps in that study. Uh, I will give some quick reminders as to what's in them so that we can keep this picture going, and I will refer to it on and off as we go. Um, but we're not going to do a study of the Concourse on High here because there is a study of the Concourse on High. We're not going to just do a study of the natural world here at this time because that is actually a completely different study. So Hahut is gone. Malakut is a whole study. Nasut is the realm in which we're living. So what are some central reminders that I hope to put forward here regarding Malakut? Because they will apply conceptually to the worlds above that of the inmates of the All Highest Paradise and the Tongue of Grandeur itself, that manifestation. Some of the central reminders I want to put out is to recall that in our study of the realms beyond, we looked at passages from the different central figures, and we saw that there are infinite worlds, both, if you will, countless, uh, if you will, like a multi-multi-multiverse, and they are infinite in their range vertically. That the concourse on high, that domain that we pass into beyond this life, actually goes on forever. But that in each of these worlds, there is a heaven and a hell. And this is something I stressed again in the worlds beyond deepening, that the the central, uh, the, like the central figures of the Baha'i writings, tell us that in each of these realms there is a heaven and a hell, that in each of those worlds there is a manifestation of God, that we in this life are creating our body, if you will, our spiritual body, for the next world, right? And I did quote one that where the, that that body is composed of the elements of that world, and that we are developing that body that we will inhabit upon the death of this, this in which we live, that we in our, ourselves are, if you will, multiply realizable, <laughs> right? There is this essence that we are that itself becomes embodied over and over in spiritual realms, if you will, and that one can inhabit this domain of Malakut, this concourse and high eternally, and that in each of these worlds, there is a heaven and hell which is acknowledged as recognition or denial of the manifestation of God, and that our job is actually to explore and seek out truth and beauty and virtue 
I mean, pa, the source of beauty, virtue, power, and truth in each of those worlds of God. Now, all the conceptual confusions, if you will, because if we can take Malakut, that's a different study, we've already done it. Ha, it's crossed off, not, not suit. The nature of the world in which we live will leave off. We can now look at, well, what we have now is this sun, uh, the primal will, the first remembrance, the lot tree, the tree beyond which there's no passing, the tongue of grandeur from the obligatory prayer, through whom the letters B and E have been joined in it together, and then we have this, uh, the inmates of the all eyes paradise. And I propose that this is actually where all the confusion seems to really occur. Why there is this confusion um, within the different dispensations and how we have understood our different scriptures. So these, it's really, if you will, the one and the many. What is the relationship between the one, the manifestation of God, and its effulgences, its traces, its manifestations, its signs, its symbols, and how that relates to the station of some very peculiar characters. And I'm going to state up front that I believe this is this primal will, what was called the primal will, or the first remembrance, or the word, right, is what we really see being talked about within the different dispensations. And I hope you'll join me for the next section, which we'll look more into now that we've been able to, if you will, cross off Hahut and Malakut and Nasut, and we are left with Jabarut and Lahut, and that being the manifestation of God, uh, the One, the Son, and its embodiments in a, if you will, a category, if you will, of the inmates of the All Highest Paradise, and how this relates to the different dispensations we will see later. But I'm going to take a moment here. And we're going to stop, and we'll, when we come back in our next session, we'll be looking at the difference between the one and the many, and what we can actually hash out in that realm.